everyone, it's Quickie Baby and welcome back to World of Tanks and today I'm going to have a heart attack playing the BZ-75. This is the tier 10 Chinese heavy tank with those fangled rockets on the back of the vehicle and it's pretty much a huge derpy vehicle. It's kind of like an all-round heavy tank. It truly is a super heavy with the amount of hit points that it has. 2,500 base, so when you get yourself a nice bounty durability on this vehicle, and you've got all the field mods, you are starting to get near 3,000 hit points. Add to this, 650 alpha rockets to allow you to go and advance into early positions. And I have two builds on this vehicle. One without the turbo, where I'm going to be using durability, gun rammer, and fence to have mo maximum durability maximum firepower and the other build on this vehicle i like to take a turbo so i can try and rush some flanks but no real flanks to rush here it's just going to be all about those big old shells that we can get into the side of the vehicle and um yeah this 152 it is pretty darn reliable it doesn't have the best gun handling in fact i think some people will say that i'm trolling by not using vertical stabilizers on this tank but uh, recently I ended up having some pretty good games on this vehicle and so maybe a masterclass is on the horizon where I can pitch in and have the, uh, the full opinion about what equipment I would recommend. So in this kind of a scenario, just the Chieftain is so much better than us. You know, it's got 10 degrees of gun depression. Sure, it doesn't hit as hard as we do. We've got 650 alpha. The Chieftain has 440. But the issue is, is that when you have these big old weak points on top of the tank, this one's not got one weak point, not two, but three weak points. It's basically a whole bar of fail along the top of the BZ-75 that it makes it very tricky to be able to poke the ridgeline. And we're basically taking risks each time we are. So this, this is it. Perfect example right there, right in the middle. Do you see it? He decided to shoot the middle one out of the, uh, the one to the left and the right. And that's why the BZ-75 is just so brutal on a ridgeline. Because you're never truly safe. Everyone can manage to penetrate the uh, top bars of the vehicle. And you don't have 10 degrees of gun depression to really make yourself super flexible. But boy, does it feel good when you hit for 650 and you only receive a mighty low roll of 358 from the Chieftain. And yeah, this is what this game is. We have to be aggressive. We have to poke. I see a lot of people play the BZ-75 and they just don't poke. And if you don't poke and you don't take the risks, then you're not going to be making any progress. And I, in this kind of a scenario especially, we have to poke, we have to take risks, we have to trade hit points, because my team is down by two tanks, down by 2,000 hit points. And if that continues, well, it's just going to be an absolute disaster. So we're going to put a lower round into the E5, but wow, that E5 has a great rate of fire, absolutely punishing us right now. And even though we're using fence, we're using a gun rammer, wow, this E5 is taking huge chunks out of us left, right, and center. Like the weak points on top of this vehicle, right? So I'm going to switch out from an AP round to a heat round because they're much more effective at going through the weak points on top of the E5. But you know what? If he wants to just expose the whole of his side armor, I'll take it as well. And while this game was going really well initially, suddenly, you know, 1,200 hit points, wham, bam, from the T110 E5. And now things were not looking too healthy. But we still got 600 HP. Artillery wants to quickly shave that down to 446. I'm lucky that our heat round goes through the top of the 268 version 4. And I think at this stage, apart from the tank destroyers behind, I was starting to think, oh, this, this is done, right? Just the VZ-55, who seems to be looking like he wants to abandon this position, as the 268 version 4 is going to go after the Fosh 155. I'm looking for the version 4 here. They're wanting to try and get a shot into us, so the last thing that I want is to be removed from this game. Although, again, i got to try and keep poking to try and bait out the shot, because we're down by 4,000 hit points. When that is happening, if you don't play, especially as you can see down the southeast of this map, then you just get further and further behind to a point where you're unable to come back into the battle. So right now it's just wiggling left, right. Hope the Minotaur sucks. VZ-55 is trying to hide behind me right now. I bounce the shell. We're going to have to lurch forwards. And um, maybe I should have even used a rocket here to go up. But remember, the, you can't stop the rockets when they've started. But oh, we clutch shot into the Minotaur. You can see a, a flick of the wrist there. We had to do that as quickly as we could. And it looks like the 268 version 4 presumed that the Minotaur was going to deal with us. And now they're in a tricky scenario where they're getting locked down by the VZ-55. And suddenly we are back into this game. But not by much. We're up by one tank, but we're still down by, you, you guessed it, 3,500 hit points. And these are the kinds of games where you know that you have an opportunity for absolute glory. Or that you're going to have to carry your socks off to even have a chance of being able to, uh, to get through it, right? It's always crazy for me when you've done 5,000 combined 
and your team is still behind by a sizable amount that you're going to have to do some big work to be able to catch up. All right, well, the VZ-55 is pushing. I, I pinged the map. I'm not sure if I told the Manticore to try and get some vision there. I didn't actually say the, the Manticore to go, but I did actually ask them for help and then suggest that maybe push the, the C9 area. And the, the Manticore says, oh, smart idea, XED. Okay, well, buddy, what else do you want us to do in this scenario? You can't really push into the town. And I think taking the most sneaky tank to reclaim the east before they manage to go and deal with our remaining artillery would probably be the best play for it. But who knows, maybe the Manticore will go and use the most sneaky tank to extend to the edge of the map and to be able to push through. But it looks like they're worried about the Object 140 and the Leopard, who were last spotted all the way down to the southeast. All right, no point in arguing with a Manticore who wants to do their own thing. And they've decided they want to go and try and hunt the middle of this map. And so as the Manticore advances with the 705 in position, that's where the rockets are going. You see them activated in the center of your screen. And even a vehicle without a turbo, or should I say even a rocket tank without a turbo, once you've got the field mod that increases the top speed by two kilometers an hour, it's kind of bombing it along at 47 there. And that's what's so special about this tank. You can either take the turbo and have like 54 kilometers an hour to be able to get into position, or you don't take the turbo and you just use the rockets to be able to get to hopefully a position where that's all that matters. Luckily for us, the Ho Re and the Manticore managed to shut down the FV405. And while we're still up by one tank, we are still down by 3,000 hit points. That just seems to be a recurring theme of the replay today. All right, so I'm hoping that we're going to get some spots here on the batch at 155. 155555558 or the 15558 even as the Ho-Ri shuts them down and I'm thinking do I boost up here to go after the 140? The problem again with the boost is that you can't turn off the boost and so you have to only go forwards. You can't just stop the boost but oh my word did you see that? The artillery just hit the Rhymatile on the move for like 800 and luckily for me this object 140 seems to be a little bit sleepy and while we're Low rolling pretty much all of the shells, all four of the last shells low rolled. Was it, was it even worse before that? Now, to be fair, earlier we rolled a 700 on the IS-7, which was pretty delicious. But we're going to need some good RNG to be able to get back into this one. Talk about good RNG, the 140 fails to damage me. We put a shot through the tracks of the 268, and just like that, our RNG is back on with nearly 700 damage dealt. And 500 tracking, which I was pretty happy about, as I'm in the process of trying to 3 mark the BZ-75 as well. And now things are looking real good. We're up by four tanks. We've only got, we've got, even got 600 hit points more than the enemy team. This is looking absolutely fantastic. So I decided, okay, I don't want to really drive down in front of the leopard. I don't want to get proxy spotted, but I have to get the ambush here. So I'm going to come forwards, lurch, and I just have to commit to this. Luckily, we get the 140. I decide to activate the boost to be able to get forwards as quickly as I can. And the VZ-55 even gives us a thumbs up. And we can see the rockets there helping us to be able to get under the gun line of the 140. Uh, sorry, not the 140, the Leopard. And that is really what's special about these rocket tanks. So unfortunately for us, the STRV shuts down the VZ-55. And while we are up by three vehicles, this is still neck and neck. It's a two versus five situation for the enemy. I ask my team, where is the STRV? And um, it looks like the VZ-55 was pinging over towards the uh, the G9 area. So in this kind of a situation, it's a little bit tricky. The Leopard could be pushing on towards the artillery. The STRV is the one who's managed to pick up a couple of kills. But really, I was thinking that the Leopard was either on the hill around here or here or just being in front of me. And I thought that I'd get forwards and try and create uh, a line of sight for my team. And there we go. There's the Leopard, still on 1,112 hit points. I don't get spotted, so I can go forwards. The artillery misses very badly, and just hoping that I can manage to take this one. And boom, there we go. 584, with the Leopard actually turning their turret towards us, even though we weren't spotted there. Although it's fairly predictable where a BZ would be in this scenario. So I ping the map, tell my team where the STRV is. They're spotted, they lose 700 hit points, and I'm just hoping, 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 hoping. Yes, we hit them for another 596. Wish that one had rolled just a little bit higher. Okay, so the Leopard's 528. I've got 650 Alpha. Practically impossible that I don't destroy them in a single shot. The STRV as well was spotted on about 400 hit points. So, yeah, uh, they're both a one-shot for me. So, again, you see that what I'm trying to do is just keep a, a buffer zone between the Horethru and myself. But in this scenario, the worst thing that I could let happen is that the Leopard makes their way around here and then goes into this position or above them and spots the Hori 3. So I suggest to the Hori 3, go to building. 
And the reason why I'm saying this is that if they have a leopard who manages to get a buff above in this high ground area, they will be able to shoot down if the Hori 3 is in that area. Whereas if they're behind the building, they will be safe from the leopard. And what I'm going to do is try to intercept. And now with 10 seconds, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. You couldn't script it. The leopard manages to interrupt and... What? I rolled for 521, leaving the leopard on seven hit points and now they're no longer spotted. Okay, I've got no boosts left. The STRV, to all intents and purposes, could be going after our artillery or making their way down towards the south and now the Hori 3 is a one shot and we have to deal with two sneaky tanks. I was not expecting that. The VZ55 says it best. What was that low roll? I don't have time to uh, converse with the VZ55, so I just press affirmative and cry myself a little bit of pain. I tell my team I have no rockets left because I thought that would be interesting information for the Hori 3. And oh god, I get spotted again. The STRV in location up near the wreck of the 268. And where are those rockets, man? Oh man, getting trolled by the dead manticore. Bit of a misplay there by me. I should have gone around the left. But I'm just hoping that I can get behind these trees and just survive. Luckily, the STRV only pens one and they don't high roll. Meaning that I still have 88 hit points and now my adrenaline rush has been activated. Although now that means that I'm definitely a one shot for the STRV. And unfortunately, the Leopard finishes off the Hori 3. And we now find ourselves in a two versus two scenario where we have the saving grace of having a self propelled gun. So again, this vehicle, three minutes left on the game, three kills to our name. I'm just thinking, where is this Leopard going to be? It looks like the artillery on our team maybe tried to blind fire a shell there, possibly the STRV. I'm thinking the Leopard might be trying to wrap around to be able to come at me from another angle, thinking that possibly the STRV could advance now. What is the plan of the enemy team? So I was just thinking to myself, just hold the position, hold the base, try and see if maybe we get a bit of good RNG and see if we can um, avoid them spotting us. But in this kind of a scenario as well, the worst thing that you can do is to not try and extend your vision and spot the enemies when they're coming after you. Because if they do find you, and there's two of them, and there's one of you, the game's done. Unless you destroy one and the artillery manages to hit the other. So you still want to try and extend your vision. My heart was pumping. The blood was flowing. This is the kind of carry that you live for inside World of Tanks. 9,000 combined in this battle. Over 8,000 damage and we still haven't won. What is there to say about the BZ-75 in this scenario? Dadin on our team makes the interesting suggestion. Are you fast enough to get back to the cap if they would start? And yeah, I would be fast enough. Even without a turbo, I would be. Even without the rockets on this tank. But it's a reasonable suggestion. And now that I know that the Leopard is back in base, I'm not going to be able to cap against the STRV. And the Leopard is going to cap to be able to start the timer. And they are in the cap circle with enough time to be able to cap. So I know it's not a bluff. So I always play to win. In this kind of a scenario, I have to go back and I have to interrupt the Leopard. That is our only chance in this battle. So that's exactly what I'm going to do. I don't have time to dilly-dally. I know the STRV could hit me in the side here, but I don't have time to worry about that. I just have to get to this ridge, maybe use that bush that's right in front, see if I can spot the leopard without getting spotted, and hope that the STRV is in a different part of the map. It's going to be chancy, but unfortunately, you've always got to make the best of a bad situation. And that is exactly what we're going to do here. I'm going to have to crest this ridge and hope that the leopard's bad, but it looks like the leopard must be behind the trees. I'm going to blind fire where I thought the leopard would be. However, it wasn't to be and the leopard was not there. The leopard on their seven hit points reverses now through, I guess, thinner trees without foliage on them. No leaves. They actually ricochet off us. So we managed to get the interrupt on the leopard. And now with 43 seconds left on the game, what is the plan? Well, I turn my armor towards where I think the STRV is going to go. I just hesitate on the ridge line a little bit just to be able to get the shell in. And now I must advance. There's no point in a draw. There's only a point in a win. And the STRV spotted right in front of us. They managed to track us, unable to damage us. And I'm looking for that weak point. I'm looking for the upper hull. And I decide to take my chance with only 20 seconds left. Now the STRV is aiming at my lower plate again. And... Our heart attack turns into an absolute heartbreak. And 
you know what? A lot of people were uh, still chatting there. We had two VZ55s watching for the entire game. Dadin says, nice. Canasta NBG says, well played. And we gave it a good go, boys and girls. But unfortunately, it wasn't enough. So if any of you have wondered how to deal with an STRV in that scenario, well, when you have 152 millimeter, you can actually overmatch the entire upper part of their vehicle. So you'll see that when he had his cupola exposed, I was looking for that. And then when he was going to crest the ridge, I'd feel actually safer just firing above the gun rather than trying to hunt the cupola over the ridge line. But in retrospect, I probably should have aimed just below the cupola there to be able to get the shot. The STRV took the chance on me. And remember, we have three great weak points on the top of the BZ-75, so I didn't have time to uh, to mess around on that ridge line. But very well played to the STRV on the enemy team for shutting me down there. And also for the Leopard, they managed to get eight frags between them at the end of that battle in an ultra cool, ultra close game of World of Tanks. So this was an ace tanker for the BZ-75 Heartbreak. That was a lot of base experience if we also include Courageous Resistance, a Confederate for dealing damage to six tanks that were subsequently killed by our allies, and a high caliber for the 8,300 damage that we dealt. We actually damaged 11 of the 15 tanks on the enemy team in this game. And we just needed to damage one more in the form of the STRV. So the BZ-75 flexing its raw power and attributes in all of the interesting areas inside this game. And stay tuned to the channel as I don't think it'll be too much longer before we have more BZ-75 gameplay. Anyway, ladies and gents, boys and girls, hope you all loved this game. If you did, give it a thumbs up. If you hated it, give it a thumbs down. And if you're watching this video as it goes live on Monday, I'm going to be going live all day on twitch.tv forward slash quickiebaby giving you new drop tokens. And also today, I'm going to be playing three hours of FV4005 as a bit of a challenge. So come along right now. I'm sure it's going to be a banger. And as always, thank you so much for watching. You've been epic and hopefully I'll see you soon.